Um, okay, hi everyone, I'm Duncan Meeting. I'm a designer maker from Tasmania. Um, I suppose, this, uh, I was about to say who here has heard of Tasmania? Okay, well, Tasmania is, okay, okay who here has heard of Australia? Okay, um, anyway, if, the other thing is, I should probably tell you now, in case some of you are putting your hands up in response to that question, I can't see your hands, I'm, t I'm partially blind. So, um, you know, if later on, we're, if we're doing any sort of conversation, or questions, answers, or anything like that, we'll just work out some way of doing it other than um, putting your hands up, we'll just, people didn't just talk or something. Um, so, I'm about to start to play a video uh, through the computer here, and uh, just sort of give you that little explanation in, in terms of my, my vision um, because the, you're going to start hearing some little talking stuff and I will talk a little bit about that in terms of the way I um, operate in, um, in terms of designing um, and, and making. So I run my own small design and maker practice in Tasmania, Australia um, and it's been running for about eight years and I have my own factory, of, a workshop factory of, and it's about 100 square metres. So I'll start with the video and then I'll maybe talk a bit about uh, my place which I'm from because uh, I'm meant to be relating that back to um, design and place and, and how the two are intertwined. Um, just bear with me for a minute. Hi, I'm Duncan Meeting. Um, I'm a furniture and lighting designer based in I just, I just put these videos on for a bit of context first and then I'll talk a bit more about the actual relation to design and place. Um, just so everyone has a bit more of an idea of some of the scenery of Tasmania and also uh, some of my work to give a bit of context to what I will be talking about.
stuck in meeting with some. Hold up. Hey, 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 stuck in meeting with some. I go in. Type menu two three. I can see you. Type modify rate two pay ninety two dot pay. DSC zero nine nine. Log us. See all photos button. Sorry. Not very good with images. Um, I'll try and show some images in a minute of um, some nature and things. So um, as you can probably see from some of those videos, a lot of my work is inspired by nature um, directly. And I think um, this, this is quite important, but also in general, um, there's a lot of things that influence, influence the way we create and the way we design. And I suppose that's quite an interesting sort of premise because a lot of people do talk about um, uh, design and um, you know coming up with an idea, but the idea, all our ideas are influenced by something else, um, and you know that's quite an interesting philosophical pretext to sort of start a dis discussion around in of itself. Of you know um, you know that's the constant sort of discussion that ta takes place is you know. Are our ideas governed by our reality or are our realities governed by our ideas? And I think it's simplistic to just go one or the other, but the two are definitely um, have some degree of interaction. So if you have an idea, it's obviously going to be influenced from something. Um, then the idea of design is to you know, improve, um, that's what the, the paper was uh, referring to, um, the, Latour, the Bruno Latour paper was referring to, the word in French that was referring to um, to improve something, to refine something. Uh, I think design is not just to improve and to refine, but it's to, it is to innovate and to create. Um, the um, but it's not to do these things in a in a vacuum. Um, you know, we don't. Uh, the chair, for example, didn't just come about because you know we decided to have a chair and sit. It came about due to a a, a brief of a problem that we had. You know, we needed something comfortable to sit on, um, and uh, through the process of, of, of you know putting four sticks on a on a piece of wood, um, you you know you've developed a developed something you can sit, can sit on in a more comfortable manner than necessarily sitting directly on the concrete floor, um, and you know that ultimately gets refined and resolved further and further, um, you know with angles of chairs to make your back and everything more comfortable, but um, in terms of uh, the, I've actually got a few notes and things, but if you can bear with me for a minute, I'm just going to start try and actually deal with my te technological issue and put some images on. Um, um. Okay, so it's, it's not really panning through the images um, automatically, so I might just manually go through them, but you can probably see through yeah. some, some of these sorts of images the sort of influences that have come about from some of the images that you saw in the, in the videos. Um, but I'll, um, um, you know, Tasmania, where I'm from. Um, okay, so um, just to give you a bit of context, ta um, Austra Australia is quite far from here, about 13 hours on, a, on an aeroplane. Then Tasmania is another two hours on, a, on another aeroplane from, from Australia. Tasmania is actually like Rajasthan is to t um, India. It's, a, just a, it's just a state. Of 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 um of Australia, but Tasmanians like to see ourselves as a bit different. Um, but um, we you know partly I think because we do have quite a strict identity in terms of this, the sh um, sheer amount of wilderness that we have. Um, we've also got a very l large amount of art um, and co um, it's a bit more relaxed there. So the small the island is um, th it takes about five hours to drive from one end of the island to the other. Um, and the, the majority of the island is actually a World Heritage Wilderness Area. Um, the, the total population of Tasmania is half a million people. So the town that I'm from is 200,000 people. So in terms of uh, you know, um, design and, and place and, and place in general, I'm sort of feeling a little bit out of my place at the moment in terms of the sheer size of Delhi. Um, just 
sort of quite over quite overwhelmed um, and culture shocked. But you know, um, you know, coming from effectively a, a, a village in terms of its size size of people. But um, uh, yeah, so I, I'm in Hobart. It's on the river, and there's also above above me there's a, a big a big mountain. Um, and in terms of sort of a lot of my work, it comes about from walking, uh, the original idea and inception of my idea comes about from sort of being in nature, uh, walking through it, and is something I like to refer to as med meditative design. So when I'm walking through um, uh, the, on the beach or through, through the wilderness, uh, if I, I, I get to a point where I'm, I'm just not thinking about anything else, um, and then all of a sudden I come up with ideas of uh, different forms or different ideas for, for, for my work. Um, and uh, it's just purely from not having the hustle and bustle of the city, uh, not having other people talking to me, um, just, um, ha just being in this, pro this process of just one, one foot after the other, walking, walking along. And, and it's at that time that I often will come up with my initial ideas from, for the work. Um, now that's not to that in of itself is not the, uh, the, the that's not designed. Voila, you've got something done. The, that's the the initial uh, aha moment of the inception of the of the design, and then from that I've then will come about with um, other ideas for. Um, uh, I mean, I will refine the design, uh, work out ways that it can actually go together, um, and. You know, just to give you an idea of how long this process sometimes takes. Once I had an idea in 2011, and then by, it was only by 2015 that I actually have had a working um, product. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll put on some Im Im images in a sec of that. So these are just some different wilderness images um, of the area. And then. Okay, hopefully it works this time. Sorry. Um, uh, sorry, my, my software is... Is just it's just complete. Okay, bear with me for, for a sec. Yeah, I'm trying to turn. Yeah, that's a good idea actually. I might just unplug the um the the headphone. Is that all right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, that might make things. Why did I just unplug it? What the hell? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Shall I mute it for a minute? Yeah, I can always just put my head headphones in. Yeah, that's a good idea. It's funny the music's there. Really? Okay. <laughs> hey God. Ah, sorry, uh, that's working. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> oh. Okay. There. Um, now I'm trying to remember where where I was up to. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah. So. Uh, th yeah. So through a lot of the work, work I've sort of developed. Different, um, different things uh, to do, uh, with, with that design. I've actually got this design here at the moment. Um, I won't put it together necessarily, but I'll bring out one of those sort of leaves and pass it around. Um, and you'll see some of the overheads. Uh, sort of it shows what the eight components do in terms of the way they make a, a flower shape. Um, 
the original idea came about from this was almost came about due to almost a mistake. So I had I had this 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 shape, and it was like a a, pe uh, a petal for a, a flower, and I wanted to make a something that just looked a little bit like a flower, and then just sort of from changing the orientation of the grain in the timber, I was twisting it around, and it it gave me that sort of um, the timber decided to do what it what it wanted rather than what I was telling it to do. And from that, uh, the sort of the twisted nature of the blades of the propeller came about. And uh, it's, um, it's kind of the way, the, very much a, a big example of the way I, I design. So design is not necessarily just to sit behind a computer with a, uh, a mouse and draw something up in, um, in Rhino or um, SolidWorks or whatever program um, people are using. It's also a process of understanding and, um, and methodology. And the, the key thing is not necessarily drawing with a pen and paper, but the key thing is, is the, the way of thinking. And design is very much about um, the problem solving and, and the way of sort of approaching, okay, uh, the, the different processes involved. So I'll just pass this along, um, along if you can just pass it on to the next person to sort of understand, um, just, just have, have a look at what, what, what the actual component looks like. Um, and that, piece is actually been made so it flat packs into a box um, and the eight components can then slot in and make a make a light that can be sent sent overseas um, that's another sort of thing that's quite re relevant for places um, for Tasmania and for, for the rest of the world is shipping if, if I made that light where it wasn't flat packable uh, it would be about six six times the size um, and yeah, sorry, I'm, I've had notes on here and I thought there would be another computer, so I'm trying to remember what the notes are actually saying. Um, but um, the, um, uh, what, when it gets through on all the images, I might just take the, the overheads off so I can go through the notes and talk a little bit more about um, in a bit more structured way. But um, yeah, so I think in, t um, yeah, in terms of the, the key influences that, that, are, that I have in, in terms of my work and in terms of a lot of designers' work in Tasmania is, is it's a lot of the work will f highly feature timber, um, and also highly feature um, hand making, even if it's not necessarily done by the person designing it, um, but their, their work is usually informed by it. Um, and it also will often have some degree of um, ins inspiration from the natural environment. Um, th those three are quite important to myself. And the fourth um, one, which is probably not so much uh, a place thing, but it's, also, uh, it's more of a, um, a, a sensory um, perspective thing. Um, with my vision, I've got uh, less than 5% vision concentrated around the periphery. So uh, if I walk into a room, things I'll notice more um, are the, the shadows and the light um, rather than the, the um, the, the really intense detailing of, of, of a place or, and that sort of comes about in my work as well. Most of my work it, um, is quite, uh, um, it has, has a, uh, uh, it's quite simple in form, but also has a qu quite a large concentration on, on the light sort of dispersing from the, from the side. Um, and so it's sort of, to sort of, in terms of that sensory experience that I have, it's, you, you would have seen me walking through the forest and the, and the dappling effect. And I suppose everyone does notice that, but um, I suppose that's something that I pay more attention to because I've got the, a lot of the other stuff blocked out. Um, and so when I, when I walk through the forests and the wilderness and things, uh, the, the things I notice may be different to what the things are that you notice. So, um, you know, the importance to place is, is, is there, but also one's interpretation of that, um, that place in, in of, of itself is also quite important. Um, sorry, and have we gone through, we haven't gone through all the images yet, have we? It hasn't gone through yet? Yes. Yeah, it has. So I might just take the, um, the overhead off um, and then actually try and double check that what I've said so far. Um, just bear with me for a minute. Yeah, so um, we're t talking about the um, importance of place to design, and, um, and the ex uh, it's, bear with me for a second. Sorry. 
So my computer will be talking to me and interrupting every so often, so I'm, I, may, I may just stop. Um, so the, we're talking about you know, design being inspired by other things or you know, whether it comes from within, and it's something that's constantly sort of debated. And um, you know, there's, a, there's a fairly famous quote from Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones. He's not a designer, but I think it's quite an interesting quote in terms of, um, in terms of art. Um, and he basically said that you know the, the first um, the first cave man, man and cave woman to bash bash a bash, bash a rock with a with a bone or bash a rock with a stick was um, was the first was the person to make the first um, first song. Everything after that was uh, was mere um, mere copying. Um, it's a fairly brutal way of just saying that. You know, ev everything that we do is being influenced by the society in which we are from, or come come from. Um, you know, the, our our entire soci social um, our entire socialization has um, has created who we are, um, and and the way we interpret things. Um, and so each society has a different um, you know way of doing that socialization and a different way of interpreting. For example, um, you know, a, a box or a, um, a, a chair, and so you do have different uh, ways of inter interpreting a particular um, uh, object and, and, and its use. Um, but um, sorry, that's something I've already said. Um, So the the idea of the um, yeah. So a, a lot of a lot of the a lot of the work I'm. Um, um, been talking about is sorry. Yeah, so I've kind of touched on everything in a very backwards, um, hickle to pickledy, all over the shop way. Um, I suppose for me. Um, yeah, so we've talk, I've talked a lot about, you know, that it's really, um, you know, it's important for me and I think it would be important for everyone to find a place where they can, you know, find a place of whatever you want to call it, meditative design or rela relaxation point to be able to actually think about how to uh, come up with ideas or how to resolve a situation. Um, and, you know, whether that's a place in a park or um, just a state of being, um, but you know, for me, that that is uh, the being out out in the wilderness. Um, uh, and you know, e equally for me, uh, with with design, sometimes I'll be thinking about something totally different, and then all of a sudden, the, the, a new design will you know, or a new idea will come about, or I'll, I'll, just before going to sleep, I'll think of oh, that's how to actually how to make something. So. Um, in terms of the process of the um, propeller, um, I'll just quickly touch on that because I've actually written a bit about that. The, 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 the blade that you have there, that was originally a piece of flat material that I was playing with and it twisted. And I got the form from, from that twisting and it was all held together with bits of, ribbon, uh, bits of string. And from that, that bit, those bits of string, the, um, um, and bits of string holding the form together, uh, the sort of you know idea sort of came about, and then I worked worked for on that idea of keeping all those blades in a separate manner. Um, but uh, it was quite imp quite a hard thing to execute that, um, and the um, the yeah. So the process that sort of took place was lots and lots of working with the actual materials, cutting them out trying to fix them in different ways. A lot of 
failure um, and uh, a lot of trial. And I ended up having to put all the, the prototyping away into, uh, for the propellers. And I came back to them a couple of years later and worked out, okay, and it was after having a bit of a, one of those sort of uh, moments I was talking about before where you, you think about something when you're not meaning to think about it. Um, and, you know, worked out a, a new way to make the propellers. And so it's just uh, sometimes thinking about something and staring at it for, you know, 100 hours, it's not necessarily going to fix it. Sometimes you have to walk away from it. Um, yeah, so uh, I think what I'll do, because I feel like the structure's gone a bit everywhere and I might have lost people a bit, um, I hope it's okay if we go to a question and answer discussion style thing. Um, also, because I just need some more water as well. Sorry. Does anyone have questions about anything? Because I'm sure I've probably lost, lost people a bit because of the way I did the presentation. Sorry, I'm not totally with it at the moment. I've been a little bit sick the last few days. Maybe I can work with that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, I, I think it's quite interesting because I, as a designer, design, in terms of design, design is quite uh, an interesting field to be in with a disability because um, adaptation and design are two quite similar things. And uh, there's been a lot of adaptation. So just to give you a bit of a background, my vision degenerated when I was uh, 18 in 2005. Uh, I had I had perfect vision. Uh, I could have uh, flown planes if I'd chosen to, um, uh, if I'd gotten the training or whatever. But if I was, you know, I had um, 20, what's called 2020 vision till I was, you know, um, till I was 18, and then in, eight, in 12 months, so uh, by the time I was 19, I had less than 5% vision left. It degenerated over a 12-month period, um, and if you'd said to me at that point. Uh, you know, Duncan, uh, you know, in, eight, uh, in, in a, uh, five or six years you're going to be running your own business, you know, and then in eight, in eight years you'll be running your own business with your own workshop and you'll be exhibiting places like the Venice Biennale or um, uh, I, like this, recently this year I also won an International Dark Award, which is a, a, light, a lighting design award. Um, so if you'd said that to me I would have just thought it was a fairly big joke. And so that's why often when people have a degree of misbelief that I'm vision impaired and I use things like table saws or band saws, I, I try and have as much empathy as possible because I had that same misbelief in myself when I began, began the process. Um, so my way of designing and my way of making are, are, are both quite um, different to what a lot of designer makers and craftspeople um, would would uh, would do themselves. So, for example, there's a lot of um, I went. I did a uh, yeah. So after my vision degenerated in 2005, in 2006, the end, 2000, the end of 2006, I did a crash course um, for about five days at uh, Vision Australia, which is one of the blind uh, institutes in Australia, and they uh, taught me how to approach machinery um, and and things like that uh, in a safe manner. Um, and then in sort of two that, from 2007 to 2009, I did a course learning how to use uh, machines and, and, uh, and but m more importantly, how to make things uh, in general through a mainstream institute. So it's quite interesting because it's, it's a very foreign concept, not, not just in Australia, but I think throughout the world for blind and vision impaired people to be in a mainstream institute like that learning along, alongside side, sided peers. Uh, there's this sort of concept of needing sheltered workshops and things. But for me, being in a mainstream institute with sighted people was really important because they got to help problem solve as much as I did in terms of how do I do something differently. So, for example, if, if I want to measure something, most people here would probably pick up a ruler and place it against whatever they're measuring. Uh, for me, I've got multiple different ways that I'd measure. Sometimes I've got feeler, feeler gauges. So, um, you know, the different sizes for that. So, uh, you know, veneer is, um, you know, thin slices of timber. That's like half a millimetre thick. Or uh, you can get one millimetre thick aluminium sheet 
that's also one millimetre thick and you, you just push that up against something to be able to set fences on things like table saws for example. So to get into sort of the precise nature of, of doing things like I could show people if there are machines here how I would approach, approach a machine and how I'd do something if that helps later. But um, you, you learn and familiarise yourself with machines. You always assume that the power is potentially going on. So you'd never touch the blade directly until you've, you've touched it with a piece of wood to make sure it's not spinning. And then you isolate the machine. Um, you know, uh, there's a process of, of, of uh, making, I use the things called jigs, which I'm sure in, in your fabrication course you'll get taught a bit about. So jigs are used for um, not just repetitive work, but for um, very precise work by pretty much all woodworkers. Um, but I rely very heavily on jigs. So some people would cut a, a circle out by, by eye. They'll just get a, you know, a compass or something and, and rule a line and then cut, cut to that line and then sand it. Sand, sand it. Um, but for me, what I end up doing is I've got a thing called a circle cutting jig. And there are two different, or there are multiple different ones of them, but one of them is it goes onto a bandsaw then there's an adjustable piece of wood which has a pin on it and then you can put your wood on the adjustable pin and spin the whole thing around the pin and it's just a very simple thing. And so these jigs are effectively um, uh, adaptive technology um, for which the, sol the sighted people use all the time um, or some of the time anyway but for me I rely heavily on them pretty much all the time. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's definitely a degree of alternative sort of thinking of how to approach machines and how to use them and, um, uh, and yeah, how to, how to cut something up. So, yeah, it's, it's quite a sort of, there's quite a bit, if I ran someone through how I did some, each and everything, it's, it's quite different. You know, I don't cut to lines, for example. I use, uh, use the fences on machines and I use things like a table saw quite regularly because that you can get very high accuracy with them and set up, set up the jigs. Take, take, um, if I want to take very small amounts of material off rather than measuring it by eye, something which is really quite handy to be able to do as a sighted woodworker is called kissing the blade. It doesn't mean you're kissing the blade um, with your lips. It means you're kissing the blade with the work when it's off. So you're getting the plank of wood and you're pushing it up against the, the blade um, until the blade doesn't move it as much anymore and then um, you set the fence and then you pull it back and then you push it through and you can cut um, 0.2 millimetres off at a time using this sort of methodology. Um, there's lots of little tricks uh, that can be done and you know there are also some things which I am not capable of and I've learnt that that's a good time to outsource to somebody else but I, I think that's something you'll probably find uh, when you start practicing in general, everyone has different strengths within a practice, for example, and so other people, some people take on certain certain roles in an organisation. So I do have um, other freelancers, other subcontractors come in and assist me with certain things. Um, does that sort of give a bit of an explanation, or yeah? yeah. Uh, it was a bit of an accident, um, like, uh, or not an accident, it's not the right term necessarily, but I, I, I like making stuff. Um, that was where I started. Um, when, I was, uh, when I was young, uh, I used to make things called billy carts with my, with my dad. So that's basically get a bunch of pretty scrappy wood, um, you know, old, old wood, screw it together and put some wheels on it. And you know, sometimes you put brakes on it, sometimes you don't, and you just roll down a hill, um, and you know, have little races with them. They're they're quite quite um, they're quite fun to just make things like that with my dad, um, and that sort of process sort of this is something I enjoyed. But uh, throughout high school, I also really enjoyed making things, and then when I found out after my vision went that I could go back and try and make things again. Uh, I was super excited. So I went back to the university. I was actually doing a history and sociology major um, and I ended up finding out about the, t the f furniture design and being able to do the woodwork. So I did that. Um, I, I, I pulled that into my degree and I ended up majoring in that with my history. Um, 
and then I was still thinking at the end of my degree that I was going to become a social worker um, and uh, I actually applied for a scholarship to do the furniture design for a year and I thought oh yeah I'll do this for a year and you know um, after my degree and just sort of see, see where it takes me and I've been lucky enough to have things um, happen that just have kept me doing, doing what I do and also I, I enjoy it a lot. So um, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's quite special to be able to do something you're passionate in um, and, uh, you know, um, do it every day as a job. Um, yeah, so that was, I did that, started that in mid-2010 and then, um, uh, you know, it's just sort of kept on going with it really. Uh, um, well, yeah, I've, it kind of just sort of happened in my final year at university. Like the log light, for example, which is the one which has gotten the most amount of uh, interest internationally um, in particular, is the, it came about because I had a piece of wood that was too, too damaged to use uh, in, in other applications. Um, so there were cracks all throughout the, um, throughout the log. And I was just looking at it going, oh, what am I going to do with this other than burn it? Um, you know, that was pretty much the options, burn it or figure out something to do with it. And so I looked at the cracks and worked out, well, what would happen if you had lights bursting out of those cracks? And it sort of, it wasn't a, it wasn't like I sat down and drew it up and then, you know, thought about it for ages. It just sort of came through in a whimsical way. Um, but, you know, that was one of the lights I designed in my final year of university. And the other one was the lily lamp, which you would have seen with the ceramic shade. Um, and it's sort of, I just keep on going back to the lights. Um, you know, the first, I did, I did do another one in second year, but, um, you know, it was very much, you know, other, other than that, it was mainly furniture and, and, and um, making. But, you know, it was in my, you know, the final half of my degree, I really got into into light and and, uh, and and its influence on people, and it's something that I think that people don't always necessarily take into account when designing a space, and it's something that's uh, you know it does have a, po a positive influence on people's uh, health and well-being. You know, you know, you go into a hospital, um, not um, I, I, you know most of the time the the light is a horrible sort of uh, fluorescent tube and the color, the coloring rendering index, the CRI, is really quite high. It's, it's got that really horrible blue color to it. Um, and, you know, it's direct and it's sheer and it's in your face. And ultimately, there's a, uh, there's a reason it's there because, you know, the, the surgeons and the um, other staff and the nurses need to have good, good light to see things. But it's also, I think, not amazing for the, for the, um, for the patient because, you know, you, you're in there and it feels like you're um, being interrogated. Um, but also just that general feeling that you get from it. I, I, I don't know if other people get it, but if you get that sort of blinding light in your face, it's, um, it's not very comfortable. And, and that sort of dim light being deflected from the sides is, I think, you know, trying to emulate that, that feeling you get when you're in a forest canopy is really, um, is really important to me. Mm. Well, timber is quite nice to work with. Um, that's part of the reason, um, and it's also my training. But um, you know, I have had a bit of training in metal, um, me metal and um, plastics and things. But um, for me, I think timber is quite an important thing to be able to use because traditionally it's something that we've used for y for years. Um, you know, they've found dovetail joints. You know, you've probably. Um, have heard of the dovetail joint in, in drawers or in, in boxes, that, um, but they found dovetail joints that were made in Egypt thousands and thousands of years ago. The glue's dried up, but it still works. Um, you know, if, um, there's not many other materials you could probably start to, you know, you can definitely sort of look at some things, but this, the sheer strength of, of the material and its rigidity over time is really important. But it's also quite an important material to be able to use because it can, be used for, um, it can be way more 
sustainable than many other materials. Um, timber, you know, if harvested in an appropriate way, can um, be much more sustainable than, than things like some of the metals, for example, because, it, you know, it takes so many years for the metals to actually become, um, in, come into being, um, you know, as, as minerals. Um, and it, it's even, even, this, even more so in terms of plastics, see petrochemicals and things, that takes millions of years to, to become, come into being. But uh, tim timber, you can regrow something in 20 years with, with some timbers or even less. I think bamboo you can grow in five years. Um, so if you can work out designs that utilise timber and uh, um, that last as well, um, you can create, create things that, um, you know, it, it's, not, it's not ripping up um, huge amounts of gro ground to, to create. Um, it's also, um, you know, it's a way of stop being able to store carbon as well. But, you know, as much as all of that, as much as I say all of that, I also just think it looks really nice um, and it also feels really nice. Um, so, yeah, I do have a great affinity to, to, to making things with timber. Was that the question about timber? Sorry, I got, yeah. Um, there are certain ways you can um, get things to happen. So, for example, um, you can get timber to bend, um, but you know, if you if you if you get a, a, a stick of timber that's you know uh, 20 millimeters square, for example, and you, you try and bend it, you're you're just going to snap it. Um, but if you just if you uh, get some green timber and you steam it. You know, you apply steam and things in a certain way. You can change the cellulose nature of the timber, and you can bend it around a form. Um, you know, there's there's a fairly you know, or or you can also get um, lots of thin la laminations of timber. You know, two millimeter thick laminations, and get ten of them, and you can bend it, and you can get timber to do some quite amazing things. Um, you know, it's the same with other materials as well. So you know, there are definitely things you can get t um, materials to do, but you know, there are also things that you can't get materials to do, but through, it's definitely a lot of process of uh, um, trial, trial and error. So yeah, uh, the, the bending um, op idea is a really Im important one because for ex when, we were at, when I was at university, that was, we had a whole unit on bending timber because that was um, such, a, you know, it's su it's such an interesting uh, way to be able to make things is using bent timber. Um, and you know, but if you if you go into it without any training and you go, oh, I want to bend this stick, you're just gonna. It's not possible. You'll just do it. And you're like, oh, it's a bit broken. Oh, I can't do that. Throw it away and give up. But you know, you know, you you, you, you try you, you try all these things and you you um you know you try and learn different th ways of doing things. And you know, there are there are certain things that you can't do as well. Like you can't. Um, you know, you, like you just absolutely can't do certain things with certain certain materials and. But you, you do l just learn these limitations of the materials, but you don't learn the limitations of materials just from a book. You kind of have to learn it very much from um, the pl playing with the materials, um, experimenting with materials. Um, and th that's something that I think is really important, not just for designers, but for architects, for artists, for everyone. Because if you're designing something with a material and you don't know the properties of the material, you're potentially going to be designing something that breaks. Um, and you know, you can read as many engineering books as you want. You know, the, having having a general understanding of making will really be good for informing how, what what um, can and can't be done with certain materials. Um, uh, and yeah, in terms of dealing with with not knowing what what you can and can't do, my I suppose my um, my entire practice has been based around making mistakes. Um, and you know, that's that's the the main way you learn is um, making mistakes really. Um, and uh, yeah, dealing dealing with it. Um, I'd, I've definitely cried a few times over some of the mistakes that I've made, um, but it's it's just part of the process of learning. Um, so often, what happens is when we have have an idea, and then we tell them to learn it Um, uh, deal with it, but also, um, yeah, learn that, okay, it, maybe you can't 
work out a way of doing it one way, you need to work out a way of doing it another. Um, there's, um, you know, there's multiple ways you can approach the situation, and it's not just there's not just one way of doing it. It's not a um, you're not dealing necessarily with a uh, with absolutes in design, um, because you know the whole idea of design is to think laterally. It's not to be like oh I can't do it, give up. It's okay okay let's try and do this as much as possible. Um, uh, sorry, my f um, my watch was interrupting. Um, the um, yeah, it's it's very much a process of okay. What can I learn from how this this project has worked, um, t turned out the way it has? What can I actually learn from that? Um, can I w work out a different way of doing it? And you, I used the example of the propeller before. I was really, really set that I was going to make it out of bamboo and make it flat, and make it totally flat pack so that it'd be really thin to post. But the problem was I just could not make something that would be the the correct form, and I just kept on cutting it out. I did it like five or six times, or maybe even more. I just kept on making the same things, and I just kept on doing diff different, well, not always the same, but sometimes different mistakes, um, and. Um, I had to put it away and then go and do something else and then come back to it and that's when I developed the new way of bending the timber using multiple layers of, of, um, of timber and glue. So yeah, you can deal with it a bit but also, uh, also go, okay, oh, I do like the result. Like the propeller came about from a, sh uh, a shape that I was, I was trying to attain a totally different shape and it came about you know, kind of just through experimentation. Um, you know, it's not just the final result, it's also what you're doing along the way which is important. Um, and yeah, so dealing with it is, is important but also going, okay, what can I learn from this situation as well? Um, yeah, so a lot of the lights I do do are quite ambient, but the, the down lights, the propeller lights you would have seen, um, they can provide quite a, a broad cast of light to, to the, um, uh, for people to be able to sort of operate, um, you know, eat, eat dinner over, it's a good table light or something like that. Um, but, you know, it's also, I think, having a shade around a light is quite nice as well for when you're looking at it from the side, you don't get blinded straight in the eye. So being able to focus the light, but also um, use it at the same time. Um, sorry, be able to focus the light, but also being able to um, not get blinded by it is really important. Um, you know, uh, so yes, it is quite a big theme, but there are also other lights that I do do, like, like the different pendant lights that do cre create a degree of functional lighting as well. But, um, yeah, I suppose taking it to a whole new extreme was, I don't know if you saw the giant log scu sculpture. It was like a, a giant uh, 1.5 metre long tree basically that was um, uh, bolted into the ceiling of a, of, a, of, a, um, of a bar in Hobart in Tasmania. And it was sliced up log and it was just light coming out of the slices. It kind of just looked like someone had sliced it with a sword um, and it was all just sort of stacked on top of each other in, in, in diagonal patterns. Um, that that was a um, you know that's taking it to a whole new extreme in terms of um, pure ambient lighting. It, it, it's you know drawing on that um, stump stump light sort of idea and the crackled light where the light sort of comes out from the sides a bit. So I suppose, um, do you know the par parquetry? Did the um, I don't know what it's. So parquetry is where you get lots and lots of pieces of timber, you cut them up and you join them together, and you can you can or mosaic. It's kind of like mosaic but with timber. 
Um, so it's where you cut up lots of pieces of timber and you join them together. And um, you know you can do it with you know veneer, um, and some p people will do that quite a bit as a as a highly featured thing on their on their work. They'll um, join lots of little pieces of wood together, and they'll create, for example, a sunburst pattern in a in a table. And um, that's sort of one of the things that I mean in terms of um, hyper detailing. I avoid that sort of work. I'm very much about just using just using the timber to sort of speak for itself and um, not getting really complicated with the forms. But most of the forms, if you look at them, they're quite um, simple. Um, but you know, in that simplicity, it's also quite tricky to be able to get, um, be able to execute the, the product. Um, but um, yeah, it's very much about sort of just letting the material speak for itself and not getting really caught up on the, on the multiple details of things or um, you know uh, um, you know putting gold leaf on something or putting um, uh, you know uh, weaving multiple layers of, of lace over something or you know it's very much about okay would this would this the, the key thing for me with some of my designs I, I try and attain is would this actually look okay if the mature if the whole thing was painted white um, does the form look okay if, if if you you couldn't tell what it was made out of, would 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 the form still look okay? Um, and the um, you know the, I, I do use the timber because I like like the the timber's natural attributes, but also I think for example the propeller if if the propeller was made out of MDF and painted white, um, uh, you know out of craft wood and painted white, it'd still potentially look look nice. Um, well, that's a yeah. I suppose so. In terms of my own processes, I, I do have to be careful. To, I do need to get someone to do a once over with their eyes to make sure that there's not any fine scratches that I, I would miss myself before I put on the final coats of oils or something, or before something gets sent out. Um, but uh, in, in terms of precisely answering your question, um, the um, I have had sort of different experiences just looking at. Um, the way a sighted person will interact with a piece compared to a, um, a non-sighted or visually impaired person. Um, but also there are some rather large similarities. Um, but yeah, a lot of people when they see timber, they just, their hand goes straight onto it. Um, they they want to be able to be able to feel it because it is quite a tactile medium. Um, but yeah, the, the sighted people, I mean the non-sighted people obviously will look at, um, will, will lick, look at it more with their hands than than a sighted person will, but the sighted person will look at it, you know, with their eyes a lot, and then only quickly run their hand over it. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, it's, I think um, so. Not not major differences, but people definitely do pay more attention to certain things when they've got certain se certain senses. Um, you know, the the feeling is is a big one. Um, I've just had somebody um, commission a piece in Melbourne, and they. Um, they, they're vision impaired, and I think they they chose this table partly because it wasn't glass, because their their um their their ex their ex partner bought a glass table, and it drove them nuts because they couldn't see it, and they'd constantly sort of bang into it. Um, and um, they they chose timber partly because it looked good, but also because the way it was it was designed in a way that it was nice and user friendly, and you could run into it a few times, and it wouldn't really do any damage to you. Um, and I think that's kind of a quite important thing to take into account when designing a piece of furniture. Is this going to take someone's kneecap off? Um, and I think sometimes people don't entirely take that into account. And people also don't entirely take things into account in terms of designing um, uh, is how am I actually going to use this in the real world? 
um, you know, uh, and it's not just in small, it's not just a, a, an error of a design student, it's an error that happens in a large scale in a lot of production facilities because people design something on a computer screen, go, that looks nice, print, send it off to a manufacturer, manufacturer makes it, they get made by the millions, and then there's these major mistakes in it because no one's felt it in the, pro in the prototype stage, you know, be able to feel, feel certain things. And so the, the table I was just sort of referring to that's been commissioned, it's des designed in a way that a, a child could run into it and that, that'd, be, that'd be, you know, it wouldn't be nice for them, but that'd be relatively okay. Um, you know, uh, it's something, um, you know, that I think is a big lesson that can be brought back is prototype something before you put it into production, um, but also, you know, um, uh, re yeah, really work on something in, in, the, in the real world, um, not just on a computer screen, really try and work out, okay, how's this actually going to go together in the world, real world, because that's when you'll find things won't work. And, you know, sometimes you have to do that multiple times before you get the final, final solution. Thanks. Thanks.